how, um, since when are you working with the Young Woo Media School in Myanmar? I set up the Young Woo Film School in 2005, so we've been working there for seven years. Was that possible in 2005, 2006, 2007? What was the conditions of work that you had there? Well, the constraints uh, did abound, but I think the important thing was to posit our project as an artistic one. And we didn't work with any of the um, local uh, embassies or cultural institutions um, from abroad. We decided we had to be completely independent. Yes, it was difficult. We had a long, we had, took a long time to negotiate with the Ministry of Information and finally defence in order to get a permit to do our first uh, residential workshop. But it worked. And you you are in documentaries, right? It's it's non-fiction. The main thrust of what we do is documentary, but we have uh, branched out in 2008, we started a genre that we call true fictions, it's not a new genre, it's um, a drama based on um, a real location, based on a script, but with non-actors, using non-professionals, But so it's a drama with a documentary ethos. How do you assess the whole development that is uh, going on in Myanmar? Uh, at, at the moment. You mean in terms of media? I mean in terms of media, but we all know that media are always reflecting the situation uh, on the political side. So the level of freedom in media often is very much linked to an overall political level. There's, there's no country where media freedom is higher than political freedom at the same time. And in, from my perspective, at the moment, it's difficult to know how sustainable the development is in Myanmar, actually. So what is your impression? Well, if you listen to the, um, the, 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 the government, uh, they're saying that the whole transition is irreversible. I'm not sure how much that is um, platitudinous. Um, I think if you've been working in the country for as long as I have, because I, I've been working in Myanmar for over 20 years, uh, then you learn to use whatever space you have. And I think the important time now is, is an important moment to consolidate what space you have. So I really think that people working in the media need to form lobbies and networks and to, to in order to lobby the government to create a, a, a media law that, uh, that involves all the stakeholders and is not one-sided. Patrick, you have been in Myanmar recently for workshops. Um, when you work with this uh, reporters or uh, hosts in, in, the, in the TV station, it was a TV station, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it was, it was in the moment a TV station. Actually, it is a training organization which is linked to a half state, half private TV station in Myanmar. Are these people optimistic for the development of their profession for the future? Are they uh, amazed about what, or are they? a little bit more hesitant about the development. What is the attitude that you show? Well, what I can say is that they were very enthusiastic about receiving us, um, knowing that for decades there was an opportunity for this kind of cooperation. So when we came in, of course, we had a lot of feedback uh, which, which expressed um, optimism uh, for the future. But at the same time, for me, it was interesting to see that this issue that is touching us most, what is about censorship, will it be lifted or not, is not a very big topic for them because we must, we must think that for, for quite a while this, this um, let's say, media regulation, this very strict media regulation, have been in place and have been 150% adopted by the Germans. So they, they, they know it's there, actually they don't care, they haven't kind of in the, in the flesh and blood. So there's a kind of self-censorship which is completely normal in, in, in the profession, so there are no question about it. Is, is that the same feeling you're sharing? Uh, it is a bit of a double-edged sword. I mean, now the print media has been given, um, well, they have, for all intents and purposes, they have lifted censorship for the print media, but now it's been thrown back to the journalists and they have to exercise self-censorship, which they have done in previous years. Um, so they are familiar with what can get printed and what not, but um, still, it's a, it's a challenge for them. And the uh, is there? You said the law is important now. The press law it is, in, is in place more or less. The broadcasting part is, is completely open. 
There is nothing at the moment and nobody knows where they will go with it. So obviously this is an issue for the government. They don't know exactly how far they would like to open the media sector really. What is the perspective you have on it? Well, as I said, I think it's very important that the government negotiate with different stakeholders, that these, these stakeholders have a say in it, like the MEPO, which is the Myanmar Motion Picture Organization, which is an um, association of filmmakers, as opposed to the government film industry body, which is the Myanmar Motion Picture Enterprise. Um, so it's very important that they involve the makers of films in the creation of the media law, so that they will buy into it. Otherwise, they're going, there's going to be trench war. I think we have never seen or rarely seen a, a similar situation that is really an opening or a democratization of a whole country from top down. So is that difficult to deal with when you work with, 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 with media? I mean, the private media you're working with at the moment, is this really an independent private media as we know it, for instance? Let me say one thing, picking up what you said. Uh, actually, for us, when we came in at the beginning of 2012, it was a very comfortable situation because, as you said, it's a top-down development, meaning that there is some level of economic freedom for media organization. Uh, and uh, in particular, the partner that we have, which is the Myanmar Media Development Center, uh, is uh, strongly funded by, by businesses uh, that profit from this uh, liberation of the economic aspect of, uh, of media in Myanmar. So we did find very good resources for our training, uh, technically and organizationally, and uh, in that regard, um, as you said, it's a unique situation that we do not have enough. You have said earlier that the most important thing is to provide Myanmar uh, the Myanmar people with Myanmar stories with their own eyes. Uh, is there a chance that that is part of their opening now as a kind of strategy that people look more into their own country? That there is a window of opportunity for this? Or is this still a part of civil society where you need to protect a little bit, and which is a, a small part that can be shown as a, you know, as a kind of window, but not really an opening? As I said earlier, it's important to use any space that you have, and I'm sure that any media maker or filmmaker or writer is going to still continue to use that space. As for documentary and films, um, there's been no market research done as into how these films are received. I would like to do it. I'd like to find out um, whether uh, there is an audience for, for documentary, but there was some indication that uh, people in Myanmar are interested in documentary at the two film festivals, the Watan Film Festival and the Art of Freedom Festival okay. in September and, and January, and people flocked to see the films, and I think they were amazed. What is the most important point to invest in now when you look at support for Myanmar media of freedom of expression or freedom of the media? What is the most important point to invest in now? If, if I should answer this from my very limited point of view, as I'm not an expert, long-term expert, I, I didn't see this so far, I would say clearly it's uh, investment in people. Uh, as, as we know, the, the, the Myanmar media market is dominated by very young journalists, average age, something around 25 years maybe. So there's also, let's say, there's, on one hand there's a lack of expertise and experience, at the same time there's a big future in front of you, which we can help develop it. And that's why I say we should invest in the people in the first place, and then along with this try to really just to develop structures around them. You say that too? You share this vision? Or? Uh, yes, I, I think you're right. Always invest in people. I think that's a, a EU, an EU call, in fact, investing in people. <laughs> but um, I think Myanmar's history, when it was a, a monarchy, it was of little pockets of kingdoms and fiefdoms, and it's very much still like that in the arts and media scene, and not just there. And I think it's very important now that there are people who've been let out of prison, the 88 generation, there are upcoming bloggers. Um, I think it's very important to try and bring all these people together. You won't, it won't be, you know, hunky-dory, but um, it's important that people start to talk to each other, only that is the way forward. Thank you very much, good luck for the future of your uh, uh, film school.
Thank you for being with us, Lindsay Harrison. Thank you for being with us, Patrick Benning, and good luck uh, in Myanmar. This was, yeah, an applause for our guests. Thank you very much. This was the last edition uh, of Five Minutes uh, for Debate, a uh, talk format hosted by Deutsche Welle Academy at uh, Global Media Forum. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day and don't miss the Bob Award ceremony later on. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.